A very good afternoon to one and all present here, and I hereby welcome you all to this webinar hosted by Asian Law College. The agenda of this session shall be to discuss the super specialization in law, the need of the hour. And we are in conversation with our esteemed guest today, Ms. Meena Lal, Chief Legal Officer, Tata Steel. Ms. Meena Lal is a gold medalist in LLB from Jabalpur University. She started her career as a practicing advocate in the High Court of Madhya Pradesh at its principal bench at Jabalpur. Later, she joined Tata Steel Limited as in-house counsel. In Tata Steel, she rose through the levels and has been heading the legal function of Tata Steel since 2008 in her current designation as Chief Legal Officer, Industrial and Litigation. She has dealt with litigation and diverse fields of law, such as criminal, land, mining, environment, forest, labor, to name a few. She has the experience in the field of contracts of several kinds of dispute resolution. She has been a director on boards of multiple companies of Tata Steel Group. Ms. Lal is a keen learner and a passionate professional. She has contributed into volume eight of a book series written by Mr. Samaradhi Tipal, titled Constitution of India, Its Origins and Evolution. Continuing her learning streak, during the academic year 2019-20, she has completed the postgraduate diploma in cyber law and cyber forensic. She has been recognized by the BW Legal as one of the top 100 general counsels of India for the year 2020-2021. On diverse areas of laws, Ms. Tal has taken awareness sessions with Tata, uh, within Tata Steel as well as in Confederation of Indian Industries. A very warm welcome to Asian Law College, ma'am, and I kindly request you to please take the session forward. Uh, Okay, thank you, Garima. Just a confirmation, I hope I'm audible. Yes, ma'am, you're clearly audible to us. All right, okay. It's indeed a pleasure for me to come and speak to uh, tomorrow's India that is going to soon rule the regulatory platform and the legal and judicial platform of the country. So I'm indeed delighted and looking forward to talk to all of you. Having said this, I must also say that it would have been an added privilege and honor to be visiting you all physically, personally, and talking to you. However, due to pandemic and the difficult times that we are in, we are talking virtually. Still then, we are thankful to the technologists and the technology that this session has been made possible. And I'm here able to talk to so many of you through one session. So good evening, everyone. I hope everybody is enthused to talk to me because it's a session of conversation. Talk to me through the virtual medium on a subject which is very, very prevalent, known, yet slightly less talked about, which is super specialization in law, the need of the hour. Now, of course, when I was approached by a college, I was recommended certain, certain um, topics were suggested to me, but I picked up this topic because I thought it's relevant and we should, as we are already practicing, we should talk about what is super specialization in law? How does one achieve that? With this, I would request Garima to help me with putting up the PowerPoint slides that I had prepared. There are only a very few slides so I hope the format is uh, known to you and you must be conversant with the format that I will talk you through the slides after which uh, we have the question answer session and you're free to ask the questions. I believe some of the questions have already been posted with the college for asking. Okay, so Garima, if we can go on to the next slide. So what is really super specialization? If I'm suffering from a neuro issue, I will not visit a physician. I will not visit a cardiac. This is very well known insofar as the medical field is concerned. In law, is it available? Is it necessary? Should it be uh, more frequent? How should careers of young India be framed when we look at super specialization? 
Of course, every lawyer has a burning passion. All of you sitting here in the law school have a passion for the for the for the for for doing the generic law that the country has, the colleges have to offer for you and deal with various complex issues. However, um, however small or large they might be, however personal or public they might be, and however um, important they might be for the society. But you are here today to deal with, to learn to deal with complex issues which exist in the society so that we become a greener society. By greener, I mean, I'm also in the modern days trying to use the terminology which is more eco-friendly. So when I say greener technology, I actually mean a society which has less disputes to resolve. And every lawyer who has a passion for a specific branch will have a very, very special passion for that particular field. A super speciality will really help you refine your skills and keep up with the advancement in the legal field. We will talk about some of the super specializations as we go along. It's actually, if you ask me, it's actually a boon for the evolving legal trends. I will give you a lot of examples while I'm talking. And according to me, there is a recognized need for specialization and expertise to decide complex cases of a technical nature. Disputes are no longer only civil, only constitutional, or only criminal. Disputes are a combination of the procedural law, a substantive law to say the least, and there are other combinations as well. The establishment of tribunals in India as adjudicatory bodies in specific fields is in fact based on such an idea. I'm sure all of you have read the constitution enough and come to know already that the tribunalization or the chapter dealing with tribunals has been inserted in the constitution by virtue of the 42nd amendment brought uh, into the constitution in 1977. And the 42nd amendment is one of the largest amendments which was brought to, uh, which was in, introduced to the constitution. Further, due to rising complexity of legal problems, it has become more and more desirable to seek a specialist lawyer than a general practitioner. Why do I tell you this? Why do I talk to you about super specialization? The, need, the reason is I'm a client. And when, as a client, I'm looking to resolve or advance my case, which is related to a tax or an IPR or corporate law, I'm trying to figure out who is that lawyer who's dealing with these areas of law. So therefore I say that it has become more and more desirable to seek a specialist lawyer rather than a general practitioner. Lawyers need to be highly skilled to keep up with the increasing demands of the legal market and particularly more so if they intend to specialize. Go on, Garima, let's move on to the next slide. Okay. Now, in 1950, that is much before the 77 amendment, that is 42nd Amendment Act, amendment to the Constitution of India, in the case of Bharat Bank versus employees of Bharat Bank, the Supreme Court explained that tribunals are those adjudicating bodies which decide the controversies between the parties and exercise judicial functions as distinguished from administrative functions. All of you know that there is an administrative function which resides in fact with the executive. But more distinguishably, the Supreme Court has given credence in this judgment to the tribunals existing around that time prior to 1977. Which were the tribunals which were existing prior to 1977? They are industrial disputes tribunal. There are various tribunals which are held at the level of the government ministries. For example, a mines tribunal. For example, a tribunal under a land reform law of the government, of the state government. The secretary to the department of the government serves as a quasi-judicial authority. The deputy commissioners of the districts, they serve as quasi-judicial authorities and decide disputes which where they perform really the adjudicatory functions and therefore the Supreme Court gave out this distinction between an administrative function and a judicial function, which we can call as quasi-judicial function. Then again, the establishment of tribunals as adjudicatory bodies in specific fields is based on the idea. The idea itself is coined from the fact 
that specialization and expertise are required to decide complex cases of a technical nature. Now you have electricity disputes. <clears throat> a general practitioner, a lawyer who is a general practitioner, may find it extremely difficult to understand how annual minimum guarantee is calculated, what impact fuel cost surcharge would have on the cost of power, which is very relevant for an industry. So therefore, as I said, as a client, I would want to look at a lawyer who is a very, very specialist lawyer in their own field. The tribunalization, therefore, the tribunalization of justice is driven by a recognition and an acknowledgement that it would be cost-effective, accessible, and gives scope for utilizing expertise in the respective fields. Now, I'll tell you, I'm aware of an arbitration where the dispute was expanding. Apart from the dispute around the contract, in the contract, they had something to do with insurance. It was an insurance investment contract, which was being arbitrated. Now, in this contract, it became so very essential to invite an expert who would be able to give some suggestions to the arbitration tribunal on insurance laws. So mind you, if the insurance lawyer would have been doing that arbitration, that insurance lawyer would have conveniently been able to explain to the arbitrators what is the insurance law about. I'll give you another example. In Europe, particularly, there is a practice. Not only their civil procedure uh, regulation prescribes this, not only that the CPR prescribes, but in the arbitration forum also, there is a requirement of presenting an expert witness. Now, if there is an arbitration or there is a trial under CRPC or a compensation case or a civil trial, there is a need of presenting an expert evidence. The regulation provides for it. The party chooses to present an expert comment, that expert would be called in the dock by the court and their evidence will be taken. I have read various judgments of the European Court of Justice where the attorney general is called upon to provide his opinion even before the court sit down to hear the case. So there is an expert view which is already taken by the, by, the, by the courts as well as by the arbitration panels. And this is how you see the need for expert evidence is being precipitated, is manifesting itself into this profession. Central to this scheme of tribunalized or specialization is the principle that experts appointed to these tribunals should bring in special knowledge and experience. As I already told you, part 14A of the constitution, which consists of articles 323A and B, I will not dilate, I will not read them. You are more aware of this than me, that these provisions were introduced to give recognition, to distinguish, to acknowledge the fact that we do need expert tribunals for each and every subject. And likewise, you will find that there are many, many tribunals around. And therefore, the concept of a general practitioner is restricted to high court and Supreme Court. Uh, very much, if I may request you to move on to the next slide. Yeah. Now, Supreme Court was called upon in two very, very important cases to further expand its view or thrash out its earlier view in regard to tribunalization. The question really that arose before the court is, what then would be the distinction between the tribunals and the courts? How can we deal, how can we clearly delineate the responsibilities of the courts as well as what should rest with the tribunals? The composition of national tax tribunal and the rules connected with the composition of the tribunal and the setting up of the tribunal itself was challenged in Supreme Court. In the case of Madras Bar Association versus Union of India, the court gave an outstanding judgment. It's a landmark judgment, which has a profound impact on the reality of the tribunals. The national, this is famously known as the NTT case. The National Tax Tribunal was set up to take over the then existing jurisdiction of the high courts in India, to hear and decide the appeals pertaining to questions of law relating to income tax, customs, central excise, service tax matters, etc., arising from the tribunals. The Supreme Court struck down the provisions of the NTT Act. Now you see why I say this is a landmark judgment because it paved way for further interpretation and there was a scope left for further interpretation. So in the NTT case, the Supreme Court uh, struck down the provisions of the NTT Act on the ground that the same were responsible for the NTT 
being a less efficacious remedy than the high court. So what's happening is actually the Supreme Court wants to say, look here, please make the entity more efficacious, more competent, give it more power, which will be almost equivalent to the power with a high court. The judgment struck down, struck at the heart of the Entity Act by striking down certain sections, sections five, six, seven, and 13 as being unconstitutional. Now what happened is the principle that a tribunal replacing a court. So what's, what's a tribunal in fact? As you all know, in ADR, the arbitral tribunal is set up, which is actually in the real sense an ADR, because instead of going to the court, you are going before the tribunal if you agreed with the party. Now, therefore, in all sense of application, the tribunal is replacing a court. Therefore, the principle that, that a tribunal replacing a court must enjoy at least as much of the protection of a court can be traced to another judgment of the Constitution bench of Supreme Court. In the case of very famous, this is a very famous case, El Chandra Kumar. I'm sure some of you would have read it. And applied in Union of India versus Madras Bar Association, which is another judgment in 2010, where certain provisions of Companies Act relating to the NCLT and NCLAT were held to be unconstitutional and defective. However, the NCLT and NCLAT were themselves held to be constitutional and valid in its judgment and entity case. So I tell you, that's what I was telling you that the journey which started from 1977 in the constitution started really to take shape in 1997, followed by the 2010 judgment and the 2014 judgment of the Supreme Court. The early phase of the seven judge uh, bench of the Supreme Court in El Chandra Kumar concluded, according to article 227, 226 and 227, the right of the high courts to exercise judicial superintendence over judgments of all courts and tribunals is a part of the constitutional basic structure. So you all remember the judgment of basic stru structure, Keshwan and Bharti, and there are many more. So the Supreme Court was obviously very conscious of the fact that the basic structure of the constitution cannot be disturbed. And hence, the 222nd and 227, which provide a right of governance and superintendent, which rests the prerogative with the high courts, will continue the way they are. The early phase of tribunal litigation concentrated on the constitutionality of the creation of tribunals without violating the inherent powers of the high court. You all know the high court has inherent powers. And of course, Supreme Court is all in all when we talk about Article 141 of the Constitution. So it said in the decision, in, in, in El Chandra Kumar decision, mark the end of this process by maintaining the tribunal's constitutional validity if certain conditions were met. Now, Supreme Court laid down certain conditions and said if these conditions are met, the tribunals are absolutely perfectly constitutionally valid. What was the endeavor of Supreme Court in saying that the tribunals should be made more, uh, more uh, efficacious? The reason is given out in my last right-hand side box where I'm saying that the Supreme Court in both NCLT and NTT cases laid down the parameters of efficacy and independence. You see, there's anything which any organization, any institution which is dependent on some other institution cannot remain efficacious enough, cannot remain effective enough. On the converse, a con an organization which has to meet certain standards of efficacy and has to be effectively rendering justice on any discipline of law has to be independent. So these are the two important tests in the mind of Supreme Court when these judgments were written out. Um, can we move on? Yes. Having said this, I will take your attention to several areas of law uh, where super specialization can be applied. How you will apply, I'll come to that in a moment. But fact that these are the areas, I just thought I would write down the areas of law where super specialization ought to be applied. So there is civil law, criminal law, tax law. We know the way Mr. Ram Jetmanani uh, popularized the criminal law practice. We all are in awe of him always in every case that he led from the front. So therefore criminal law by itself became a stream of super specialization. Tax law, obviously all what you can think of as a government exaction will fall under the tax under, under, under the realm of 
the super specialization of tax law. Labor laws, as we said, industrial tribunal, gratuity. Now we have four uh, separate law, la new labor codes, uh, Social Security Act, it's a Social Security Code, etc. So labor law by itself is a stream, corporate law, intellectual property law. You have so many enactments under intellectual property law. So that constitutes, makes up for another stream for super specialization. Uh, let's go on, Karima. Medical and healthcare has become so very important. Earlier, people used to call it legal medical. Even today, the language is people call it legal medical issues or medical legal issues. According to me, it can be one and the same. But in the medical legal issues, the laws that are required to be studied would also be the laws which are required to be studied under real estate law. For example, Consumer Protection Act will remain common in medical legal cases as well as real estate law. But now we know that for real estate, we have a dedicated enactment itself, which also calls for some kind of expertise. Then you have media law, admiralty law, maritime, international law. So in international law, let me share an example with you. Even in international law, see the depth of super specialization that people are looking at today and particularly in the Europe is In international law, people want to practice international disputes related to investment only. So can you believe in international law that to arbitration, that to only investment arbitrations? It's a very, very niche field. Uh, let's go on, Marima. You have some more on this slide, general corporate law, capital markets, mergers and acquisitions. And I'm sure you yourself are aware of many of them. Uh, let's go on, Marima. Banking and finance by itself is a stream. Insolvency and restructuring, a dispute resolution, white collar crime. Let me give you an example. What is a white collar crime? You see, how to deal with a white collar crime? Right now, I'm currently faced with this situation. We have a case against our senior official under Factories Act, who was the occupier under Factories Act. We are, I belong to a manufacturing company, and therefore, you know, these instances are very common for us. Now, under the Factories Act, the case is being now posted for judgment. Now, I'm giving a hypothetical situation. If a person has grown old and a person cannot go to the court, that person, should he be compelled to go to the court, the answer is presently given in Code of Criminal Procedure. But actually, when I ask myself a question, this is a Factories Act case, is it a murder case that the accused must appear in the court on the date of the judgment? The answer is no. This is a case which a person has, uh, you know, has had to encounter because of certain positions that I hold. And that's the reason that there is a need to distinguish this kind of a crime from any other IPC crime. And that's where super specialization comes in. And we go on. Sure. What can you do to specialize? So a, a few of my suggestions are here. Choose a specialization which you are interested in genuinely. Or in all these five years where you will be studying law, you may study the law in parts and pieces. The bits of law that you will study will create a picture in your mind. Now, from that picture, you may decide to pick up one tile. If you decide to pick up one tile, you must focus on what interests you most. Doing an LLB course will give you an idea of the kind of discipline you are interested in. It will expose you to various internships. It will expose you to various senior councils, various moots. Then, you know, doing internships under the uh, judges, be it Supreme Court or High Court, if possible. And this will give you an idea of what interests you most. Look for job opportunities in the specialization. See the job demands available for each specialization. Take up a short course apart from the curriculum to know more. As Garima said, since data protection is, an, is, a, is a field yet to set in, in India, some parts of data have set in to India, but not data protection law by itself. But I thought, let me train myself, and that's how I did that course. So you may choose to do any part-time courses also. Then taking up internships in other um, in, in, is another good option. Look for a specialization that is expected to boom in the upcoming years. That's that's one strategy that one can have. Having said this, I wanted to tell you, um, Garima, if we can move on. I just yeah. wanted to tell you with the help of a picture, 
what is it that makes a lawyer? Underneath, I have a very, very famous quote, which is contained in the Code of Civil Procedure written by D.P. Sarkar, the, one of the very oldest books on CPC. But he starts his book by saying, live like a hermit and work like a horse is the first message that he gives to the lawyers. And I have quoted from there. But how do you live like a hermit and work like a horse? There are various traits that the person must have. The resilience is built by a lot of components. You have to have optimism, self-efficacy, sense of humor. Sometimes it's very important to lighten up the entire atmosphere by sense of humor. And we hear so many anecdotes of the sense of humor being applied by witty lawyers in the courts. Control over the matter, competence. Now, I know of a very famous lawyer who you know, started the argument. He was representing the plaintiff, but he started the argument on behalf of the defendant. And when the client from behind pulled his gun and said, what are you doing? He said, so I'm telling your lordship, this is a case of my opponent. Now I will argue my case. So you say, how do you do on the spot thinking? How do you do the, that switch over uh, seamlessly? That's very important. You must have hope. You must have an element of spirituality to be able to take the right decisions for your client. When there is an element of spirituality, you will show up as a client's lawyer. So all this becomes relevant. Patience is important as I've put up four windows on the four corners of the slide. Patience is important. Learning by osmosis. Always be ready to learn even from a conversation. So don't dismiss a point which you are not agreeable to. Think about that point. There's no need to dismiss the point. You may still not agree with it and nobody compels you to agree to it. Then there is tenacity. You have to have the tenacity and resilience builds that tenacity to keep pursuing and pushing in the court. Transparency is the most important virtue because only when you are transparent to the client, not only to the client, but to the court, will your credibility be high and you will be taken on the face value. So these are some of the important traits. I, I know that you would be knowing most of it, but I just put all of them together over here. If you believe in super specialization, the last point that I want to tell you is super specialization will call for a lot of patience because for you to become a go-to person for any person, any client who is ridden with those kinds of disputes, <clears throat> that you should become a go-to person. It will call for a long wait. It will call for a huge tenacity, high amount of patience, but still you cannot lose hope if you've decided to become the go-to person for the society in that stream of law. So thank you very much. This is all from my end that I had prepared. Um, over to you, Garima, for the rest of the session. First of all, thank you, ma'am, because uh, I think this was more like a, a, an opener for the students who are so much curious. We, we see students, uh, you know, joining and opting for a law course today because they want to do something. Now, when that stride, uh, such sessions, uh, you know, highlight relevant aspects of law and they really guide it. It was an opener, I would say, which can guide our students where and which direction uh, they should go for. And specifically, the last part of your presentation, which spoke about more personal skills, which we should imbibe and the virtues definitely shall help our students a lot. With this, we have a couple of questions from the students and so if you would permit we can start with the Q&A. Sure. Great. Um, and the first question is, you have been featured in the prestigious BW Legal uh, World's General Counsel 100 list for the year 2020. So please share the entire experience with us. You know, <laughs> um, obviously, as anybody would feel, it was a moment of delight that I was nominated for this and I finally received the award. Of course, I thank my, um, my, my employer, Tata Steel, which gives me a huge opportunity to be at various fora and to be able to contribute to various fields in law and therefore be you know, recognized as uh, the BW Legal Council for the year 2020. It was sure, surely a moment of delight. Great. Um, Ma'am, the next question is, how important is the role of an in-house counsel when it comes to the fate of the legal matters or cases of the companies? Uh, okay. So I'll tell you in a very one word, simple answer, 
it should not be a dissatisfying answer because I'll explain why I'm saying so. The role of an in-house legal counsel is that of a binder or an interpreter. The industry gets bound to the law by virtue of understanding. And how does it understand? The in-house counsel explains to the industry what is the expectation of law. On the other side, when we are interacting, when I'm interacting with the councils, I'm able to tell the industry in simple terms, in management terms, in business terms, what is it that the lawyers are communicating? Really, I will call myself a bridge between the law and the operations of an industry. That's the role of an in-house counsel. So it's a bridging effort. Right. Uh, the unprecedented pandemic has brought major challenges in almost every profession. So what has been the biggest challenge in your professional journey ever since the pandemic and lockdown? <laughs> okay. There have been challenges because, you know, when you are personally in the courts, you actually see uh, what's, what's really, I mean, there is something, the body language also depicts a lot and you can do on the spot thinking and you anticipate questions. So you are prepared to that extent. That's one. And the other is, if as a client, I have to give instructions to my lawyer, I can't walk up to my lawyer and straight away give instructions. But yet, I must say the technology has helped us. We have found our own ways of overcoming the challenge. I still feel there is a challenge. Uh, the human mind is parallelly so creative that we found ways of overcoming the challenge. That's all that I can right. respond at the moment. Sure, ma'am. One added point, Karima, if I can make, to okay. this, this question itself. You know, <clears throat> the pandemic is now going to bring about huge and bigger challenges for our judicial, um, for, for the members of the judiciary and the councils and the litigants. I say that why is because the courts have been functioning partially because of the handicap suffered due to the pandemic. And there is a huge backlog of cases. So clients would have to have a longer wait. So while as super specialists, you may need to keep the weight, the clients also will have to keep a longer weight, particularly till the time the situation normalizes and the COVID clogging of cases is caught up here. Great. Okay, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, in law, the concept of specialization comes in master's degree. That is a LLM. And while pursuing LLB or BALLP, one reads the general prescribed subject of law by Bar Council of India and the respective universities. For students who are desirous to have a career as an in house counsel, any specific subject or subjects which they should give special focus and attention during their BLLP or LLB? Okay, so let me put it this way. Um, that the BALLB course will really give you an insight into various laws. And assuming that you wish to pick up some areas of law where you want to think that you want to be a super specialist. Now, as I said, what fascinates you? For example, today, you all are far more exposed to industries, to the requirement as an in-house counsel and the role of an in-house counsel. You're far more exposed than we were in our student times. Therefore, you can fairly make a choice. What is the sector that you want to look at? Whether you want to look at a corporate sector as in, for example, if you would look at corporate law, it will be an all-encompassing industry law. Every industry will have the need of corporate law. But if you would want to look at Information Technology Act, or you would want to look at data protection law, very few and the higher up ones only as in Amazon, Flipkart, et cetera, Googles will look at requirement for those kind of laws. Depending upon which kind of industry impresses you, whether an industry, firstly, whether in-house role impresses you, or you want to have and enjoy the thrill of arguing in the courts and take up the challenge, that's, that's question one. Having understood by yourself that you want to pick up the role of an in-house counsel, you will then have to, you can then focus on the kind of industry that you want to look at. 
if you want to look at a manufacturing industry, the set of laws could be different. But let me give you my own example. Sitting in, an, in, in a manufacturing setup, you know, you cannot, manufacturing setup or any company for that matter will have an intersection with various and diverse laws. Now, I cannot say that I will first become a super specialist and then join a manufacturing company. No. Right. I must join the manufacturing company at the threshold. Then, if possible, do courses on the side in the areas of law which are relevant to that industry, that manufacturing unit, that company, and they are of interest to me. Now, when I understand a particular area of law, suppose I understand the land laws. When I understand the land laws, obviously they become relevant for the entity. I can around the land laws also build up various other ex areas of expertise. That is one. Secondly, I can also, by virtue of understanding the land laws, I can also gradually understand the other areas of function. So my expertise, my core expertise will be in one area. Rest of it can be built around. So it can be woven. Right, right. That would be my question. Sure. Mav, we have seen work from home a new normal in the pandemic. Uh, is it difficult to ensure the team to perform up to the expectations in work from home model when we compare it with office culture? <laughs> so in office culture, obviously everybody is in front of the eyes and, you know, what are they doing, joking, etc., right. having a cup of coffee, all that is known. Right mm -hmm. now, if, you, if I have meetings, I can know if I have meetings around four o'clock, obviously it's tea time. So we'll all sit with a cup of tea. So you actually can monitor. You actually will be able to monitor. The systems are such that they enable monitoring of the colleagues and also the work progress, the work product, the delivery of the work product tells us how much a person has been involved in work. So it's okay. not too difficult. Right. Um, Indian judiciary has been discharging its function in the best interest of the society through its judgments, orders, or directions. Any particular judgment or precedent, uh, precedent of the judiciary which you feel is most important and effective when it comes to social welfare at large through judicial activism? Okay, so I will tell you a large part of the time has been given by the judiciary, by our judiciary, to much of the issues faced by the society towards healthcare. Look at, for example, the vaccination issues or the oxygen issues. There are many such issues which are related to the pandemic itself. So Supreme Court has been very, very sensitive and agile to these issues. I remember Gujarat High Court started a Suomoto uh, case also and asked you know, the government certain tough questions on COVID related points. Fact of the matter is, what are the important subjects on which any particular judgment when you ask me, I would tell you that in the increasing era of digitalization and the incessant use of social media has caused several issues to be taken to the court. Once a judgment was rendered by Delhi High Court in the case of X versus Union of India for the reasons of anonymity, they named the case as X versus Union of India. That was a case on how do you enforce injunctions on social media platform. So that's a case which really intrigued me. I studied that in depth and by virtue of that, I could read some of, I could read up some of the law in the European courts also as it has evolved. So that uh, particularly is very important and a very, very effective judgment which is being laid out. Okay. If you want to, if you want to note the date, I think it's the judgment of Delhi High Court on 20th of April, 2021. Great. Uh, Ma'am, statutory compliance plays a significant role in proper growth and functioning of companies. Do you feel it's high time to critically evaluate the prescribed lengthy statutory compliance for smooth functioning of companies? It's already happening. It's already happening because I say so because the Companies Act of 2013, while it has been amended from time to time and there have been consecutive amendments, but mm -hmm. there has been a very important amendment, I think in 20, late 2020, yeah, late 2020, because CII had taken up with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs that there are several, there are several provisions in the Companies Act uh, by which if there is a slightest non-compliance, there are prosecution cases being initiated or the provisions prescribe initiation of prosecution, which has now been done away with by the Companies Act, by that amendment. 
Okay, so it's already on, and for better functioning, a better confidence to the industry, it's important that not at the drop of a hat, criminal cases are filed or such kind of threats are contained in law. And the ministry was very, very appreciative of that, and they immediately recognized it, and the amendment has been done. So likewise, there are various laws which have been. I will give you an example where we played a role, as mm -hmm. in we played a role in you know when many of our employees who do not vacate the houses. We used to file criminal cases as per the provision in the Companies Act. Now that provision, an amendment, uh, the new Companies Act created an embargo for choosing the location of the accommodation as the jurisdiction for filing the case. Now we represented to the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, explained our difficulty, and they have been very welcoming. And yet another amendment came out in January 2021, which was all the issue for us. So there is a constant effort from the government to smoothen the function. Great. Among the technological interface of friendliness is generally low uh, amongst the legal professional, especially the one in the court logistic, uh, legis, uh, litigation now seeing the concept of e-courts, virtual hearings, uh, etc. Do you think the prescribed training on computer usage as per BCR should be observed in letter and spirit by legal professionals? Absolutely. When it comes to life and living, let right. me ask let me ask everyone here that have you not ordered anything on amazon have you not ordered any, has a day gone where people have not ordered placed orders how are we placing orders today through the digital platform right. it's a question of life and living is profession not a way of life and living definitely and therefore this is this is a non issue and it's a no brainer it's a non debate that all legal professionals must catch up with technology also to the extent that life and living for them becomes easier. So definitely the system is system is very, very encouraging. As in, I know I've read so many um, reports where Justice Chandrachur has been very encouraging and so many other judges have been very encouraging of the virtual medium of doing the work. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me put another point across here. In all arbitrations which are carried out the world over, the witnesses are examined in many situations, unless there is a specific requirement of a physical appearance, the witnesses are examined through the concept of videos. Now, how it happens, it could be an exchange, it could be Zoom, it could be anything, but then, then and there, and it provides an added advantage that you can record the session, even if a statement of a person has not been recorded by the typist, you know, as conventionally is done, the session itself is getting recorded in companies act and in, and 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 sebi also has been uh, you know has been agile enough to say that the company's meetings can be carried out on a soft medium on a on a on a virtual platform and that's how the recordings are being allowed the recordings are being done so it's 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 a very very welcome thing and therefore it's i call it a question of life and living and hence i say that the legal professionals must catch up with technology uh, with every passing day, they must enhance their knowledge. Right, right. Great, ma'am. So before we wind up the session, one last question, a piece of advice to the students of Asian Law College who are eagerly listening to the session and waiting uh, you know, for more uh, encouragement from your end in future as well. So any one piece of advice which shall help them become a successful uh, you know, legal professional in future? So my piece of advice goes like this, and I would wish to, uh, I wanted to denounce a quote uh, that, just, just let me see if I can, yeah. I want to say to all the students here, your time is limited. Don't waste it living someone else's life. I will tell you this profession actually teaches you that the time I have is extremely limited. I have so much to read, so much to comprehend, and so much to assimilate into one sheet of argument that I will advance in the court, or one piece of judgment that I will give out if I'm in the judicial system of the country. Mm -hmm. That I cannot afford to waste my time. I cannot afford to live somebody else's life. And therefore I end by saying, once again, <clears throat> that your time is limited, 
don't waste it by living someone else's life i think that's a great lesson for everyone not just a legal professional but for each one of us in any profession rather in personal lives as well uh, well it was wonderful uh, talking to you ma'am and as you mentioned in the very beginning it would have been much much better if we would have met you in person and looking for the good times ahead uh, looking forward to inviting you at our campus as well physically interacting with our students and extending your guidance once again on behalf of the asian law college students fraternity and uh, the faculty members i would like to thank you for gracing us with your presence today and we have a little token of acknowledgement a memento to present that's for you ma'am oh thank you so much thanks thank a lot i appreciate it thank you ma'am thank you for uh, being here with us and extending your knowledge to us thank you so much Thank you and all the best to everyone. Thank you ma'am.